Hi, welcome. And welcome to spring. It must be spring in Cleveland if there is snow on the ground. I, for one, am grateful for the snow as I find the prematurely warm weather, delightful as it is, unnerving. There is a phrase in the Torah that says, Ele Moadei Adonai, these are the appointed seasons of God, indicating that nature has an order and coherence ordained by our creator. As someone who believes in that integrity and, is, and who is all too aware of the destruction and threat of climate change, I am comforted by the appointed seasons of God as the unappointed or untimely seasons are not God's, but ours. With gratitude for this week's comforting order of nature then, let us take our first break to breathe. And I will just say at the outset that once we start, you certainly may continue throughout all of my musings and reflections and um, you know, go at your own pace. Uh, please don't feel constricted by anything um, that I might suggest to you. So let us find our meditative positions in our chairs or standing up or lying down, whatever, whatever works for you. And let us try to put ourselves in a different space, possibly close our eyes or just gaze softly in the distance and try to unlock some of the places in our bodies that become so literally locked up, um, hardened perhaps, but tense. Um, the places in our bodies that take our stress the most. So we can unfurrow our brows. Some people can even wiggle their scalps. I'm not one of those, but just the trying of it is a kind of a nice thought. We can drop our jaws, try to be expressionless, not happy, not sad, just kind of neutral. Wiggle our ears, let our tongues kind of lay in the bottom of our jaws. And we can roll our necks possibly. It's always a very kinky place. That's not quite the word, creaky place is what I meant. It's always a creaky place, trying to get the kinks out of in my body. I suspect others share that to a greater or hopefully lesser extent. We might scrunch up our shoulders and then let them fall and flap our arms and our elbows and twirl our wrists gently, gently, slow motion even, wiggle our fingers possibly, just to feel different sensations than we normally do. And then our attention might go inside where certainly we will focus on our lungs in just a few moments, but more specifically right now to allow all of the organs inside of us, even just because we're imagining it, to just settle, to find their places, to unclench our tummies, our waists, the insides of us that I think we clench very tightly a lot of the time. And then our legs, our thighs and knees, we can flap our legs a bit, twirl our ankles, wiggle our toes. Same motions that we used for our upper body. And when we feel sufficiently released, as it were, let us take a breath. 
I like to begin with a big one, but you can just breathe. You don't have to make any breath more significant than another. For me, it creates a kind of havdala, a separation between unconscious breathing and conscious breathing, which is where we are heading. Just to think about the breath going in and out of our bodies. And as we begin this meditative process, our breathing will change. The rhythm of it will change. But we just want to follow it and feel it and enjoy the sensation of it. If it's coming through our noses, coming through our throats, Wherever the breath seems to be, let's follow it in and out of our bodies. For some people, it's helpful to count, to stay focused with a count of possibly five going in, or six going in, or eight or four. even to hold it for a brief count of possibly the same number, and then to release it. And even to stay with the release for a couple of seconds longer until we breathe in again. The ultimate miracle. Imagine we could start every day appreciating the miraculous. When we open our eyes, just that we're breathing. In fact, there is a blessing. One of the traditional blessings thanks God for restoring our souls to us, restoring life to us. which is a response to the ancient belief that something of our beings would leave during the night when we slept. And it was only by the grace of God that it returned in the morning. There is a certain truth in that. Our consciousness leaves and our subconscious or unconscious takes over. But breathing in and out is the basic miracle of our lives. And we do it thousands and thousands of times. We do it thousands of times every day. I'm quite sure people have counted how many in a lifetime. I don't know that statistic. But we stay with the breath. Going in and going out. In the last several weeks, I have been somewhat preoccupied with the idea of hope. I have sought out texts on hope. I have asked friends the question, what gives you hope? And I have daily asked myself what it was that gave me hope on any given day or at any given time. I continue to think about the sources of hope and the state of affairs in our world that seems to be causing so many an insufficiency of hope. But the other day, I heard a commentator speaking about fear and how fear is affecting our individual consciousness, our national consciousness, and in fact, our global perceptions. In general, fear causes us to constrict, to pull inward, to be reactive and regressive. Fear is the enemy of trust, independence, of self-confidence, of self-determination, of progress, 
of careful deliberation and thoughtful decisions of goodness. It's what we try to release when we begin our breathing. Researchers, in fact, have discovered that we spend an average of almost two hours a day in fearful and anxious thoughts, which amounts to about five years of a 65-year-old's life. Researchers also tell us that about 85% of what we worry about never happens. I used to know a person who would comfort himself, even when he was young, with the saying, I'm an old man with many troubles, most of which never happened. I have always found such an attitude a bit too facile. Most lives are touched by difficulty and sorrow, by troubles. And I would never knowingly trivialize the very real difficulties that do occur. But what the saying seems to intend to convey is that when, is that when such worries do materialize, we, often surprisingly, find the will and the strength to effectively deal with them. All of which is another way of saying we can worry all we want, but in the end, the worrying doesn't help us. When troubles do come, they never appear as we had imagined. There is always a dimension we hadn't thought of. One of the hardest things to learn in life is that we cannot handle loss or defeat or a setback or a crisis until it actually happens. We can consider the possibilities. We can even develop a plan for handling whatever transpires when it does. We can discuss various scenarios and think through any number of procedures, all of which are rational, intelligent, and non-anxious approaches to any impending situation. But we can do this only as long as we understand that we will most likely need to be flexible when the actual situation evolves or happens. When the family of an ailing patient is told that treatment is no longer working, that there is nothing more that medical science can accomplish as a loved one's death is imminent, I am often asked by distressed families what they should be doing as it is so very hard not to be doing something in the face of such devastating and hopeless information. I frequently tell the family that they should just be with their loved one and their family, that there is nothing to do. I will often remind them that these moments are in God's hands, not in ours. That is a very hard place for most of us to be. Our anxiety and fear of the unknown, of death, of losing our loved one, causes us to want to do something, anything, that will give us a sense of control over a situation we cannot possibly control, and over our fears that make us feel stuck, paralyzed even, incompetent. It is at such times that our practice of meditation can be very helpful. If we can just remove ourselves for a few moments and breathe, understanding that we can only live one breath at a time and that our loved one is doing the same, it may give us just that sense of distance that we need to be with the dying person in their reality, unconcerned about any extraneous details or distractions. That is what it means to be a non-anxious presence living in the moment, which is the only thing any of us can ever do. We need to understand that fears are real and they make us vulnerable. Cynical individuals manipulate our fears for their own advantage and sense of control. And fear sells everything 
from political views to media information, to entertainment, to retail, to advertisers of every kind. The acronym FOMO, FOMO, fear of missing out, has become part of our social discourse. And yet we are the recipients of mixed messages. From our earliest days, we learn that we have nothing to fear but fear itself, that big boys don't cry, and that winners of every kind are tough, strong, impervious to human doubt and weakness. In our Torah, the leaders and people of Israel are told over and over by God not to be afraid that God will be with us when Jacob wrestles with the angel, when we are standing at the shores of the Red Sea, when Pharaoh's army is approaching, when we are about to go into battle, when we are about to enter the promised land. 39 times we are told, al tira, do not fear. But God isn't saying to have no fears, rather, God is telling us to push through our fears and to keep them in check. Al Tira, don't fear, because fears can prevent us from making thoughtful decisions. Al Tira, do not fear, because fears can take the form of suspicion and mistrust and bring out the worst in us. Al Tira, do not fear, because whether we are facing the uncertainty of our lives, the climate crisis, our country's future, or our world, fear should not be and ca cannot be our operating value. al tira do not fear, is a divine warning. When we act from a place of fear and anxiety, we will likely fail to see the whole picture fail to think through the consequences of our actions, and we will likely make bad choices that undercut our God-given potential and our opportunities for tomorrow. There is more to be said about fear and its destructive effect on our lives. But let us pause here until next time when we'll take up the topic again with a sense of our own agency in dealing with our fears and in the practice of meditative breathing that can give us perspective, focus, and a mindful approach to the anxiety that we may be feeling. Let us resume or continue our meditative practice and just breathe but focus on that breathing in and out. By doing so, we understand that at this very moment, our anxiety has no effect. Right now, whatever we might fear is not happening. We are breathing in and out. And that is the only way we can live our lives, one breath at a time, one moment at a time. I hope you will continue to breathe. By way of conclusion, however, and with some thoughts for the week ahead, I share with you words of Eleanor Roosevelt, who said, courage is more exhilarating than fear. And 
easier. We do not have to become heroes overnight, just a step at a time, meeting each thing that comes up, seeing it is not as dreadful as it appeared, discovering we have the strength to stare it down. And the words of the 13th century poet, Jalaluddin Rumi, come, Come, whoever you are, wanderers, worshippers, lovers of leaving, it doesn't matter. Come, even if you are broken or scared or afraid. This is not a caravan of despair. Come, whoever you are. May the week ahead be one of a sense of freedom and release, as the poet describes. I look forward to continuing our journey together next time. May you have a week of health, of strength, of an absence of fear, and a presence of hope. God bless. <laughs>